I'm turning to 1 Samuel 16, 14 through 18. Now the spirit of the Lord uh, departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord terrorized him. And Saul's servant said to him, Behold now, an evil spirit from the Lord is terrorizing you. Let our Lord now command your servants who are before you. Let them seek a man who is skillful player in the heart. And it will shall be that when the evil spirit comes upon you, that he shall play the harp with his hand, and you will be well. So Saul said to his servants, Please provide for me a man that will play well and bring him to me. Then one of the young men said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is a skillful musician, a mighty man of valor, a warrior, one prudent in speech, and a handsome man, and the Lord is with him. My message today is, are you considered excellent? Let's pray. Father, I just thank you so much for this opportunity. I just lift up the people here in West Virginia, Lord, and just ask that you'd bless them, O oh God. Bless them with great opportunities. Use me today. Holy Spirit, just tell me what the Father's saying. I'm a vessel that's ready to be used by you. And I thank you again for this opportunity in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Thank you, sir. You actually got to stay at my house while you were in Louisiana. And uh, him and his wife, and we told my wife and I said, look, we'll put them up. That's okay. I mean, we'll put them up in the man cave. I hope you don't mind being around all those dead animals. But uh, he told me he thought he was on a vacation. We had a pool. We built, we built that house for my grandkids. We had a little house because all the kids grew up and left. So we bought a little house, no yard, zero yard. So I didn't have to cut grass anymore. And I was as happy as could be. And my wife said, I'm not happy. And I go, why? And she said, I want a big place with four-wheelers and fishing and a pool and all this stuff. Because we got all these grandkids. And I said, all right. So we bought 10 acres, put a pool in and all those things. And now the grandkids think they're at Disney World every day. So it's worked out pretty nice. But what I wanted to talk to you about today is about the workplace. You know, we don't realize this, but we spend about 100,000 hours of our waking hours at work. That's over 35% of your life, your waking hours from 19 to 65 years old. And some of us think, you know, when I'm at work, God really doesn't care about... Uh, you know, what I do there. You know, I'm just working, trying to make a living. Let me tell you what, God is very much wants to be involved at, at work and what you're doing there. He wants to accomplish great things with you while you're at work. And I know that's hard to believe sometimes, but, you know, my father always taught me, and I know some of you already know that I, I own a, a, a college, and uh, what's so great about that was is when I was 10 years old, my dad uh, was sent to Jamaica, and we lived there for three years. I was from 10 to 12 years old, and he taught Jamaicans how to run the plant that Kaiser had built there. I don't know if any of you have ever been to Jamaica, but there's red dirt everywhere. Well, that red dirt is bauxite, and that's what which used to make aluminum. So they built a plant there and they started to try to teach the Jamaicans how to run the plant. The only problem was is, is Jamaicans didn't really have a work ethic so they were not showing up for work. So we did the best thing we thought would work is what we do here in America is we built a Sears on the island and we gave them all credit cards and put them in debt. And then they started showing up for work. And uh, they said, man, I start getting all these ugly letters when I don't go to work. I can't pay my bills. So, you know, the, we put them in debt. They showed up for work. But one of the things that my dad always taught me, uh, two of the things he taught me, was number one, son, if you have a skill, you'll never have to worry about not being able to make a living. They can put you anywhere. And if you know, if you have a skill, you won't starve. The second thing he taught me was, if you love your job, you'll never work a day in your life. And thank God I listened to him because after I got out of the Marine Corps and I went into, you know, went back to college and, and graduated in instrumentation, it was one of the most 
exciting jobs I could ever want. The problem was is that being a Marine, I had a very short fuse and I cussed like a Marine and nobody liked me so I kept losing my job. And so uh, when I got saved, it was such a dramatic change. And that's why I tell people, I mean, how do I know if I was saved? I said, you will know because you will not be the same. You will be so different and everybody will see it. You will, you'll walk in the room and people will go, oh my God, what happened? Well, that's what happened to me. And by the grace of God, he gave me the opportunity to go and clean up my reputation with everyone that I had ever messed over or gotten a fight with or whatever. God gave me the opportunity to go back and clean that all up. And that's how much I feel like he He's, he wants to be involved in our lives, not only at church and everywhere, but at work too. He wants to be involved with you there. So I wanted to talk to you about what is God actually doing with me while I'm at work. Well, the first thing that he's doing is, is that he's teaching you skills. And I know some of you are thinking, man, what's so important about that? I want you to go to 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles chapter 2, verse 13, and it says this. Now I am sending Herman Abai, a skilled man, a skilled man, endowed with understanding, the son of a Danite woman and a Tyrian father, who knows, listen to this, who knows how to work in gold, silver, bronze, iron, stone, wood, and in purple, violet, linens, crimson fabrics, and who knows how to make all kinds of engravings and to execute any design which may be assigned to him to work with your skilled men and with those who the Lord David puts in on, the, on that job. You know, sometimes when we consider men of the Bible, we always think of those who are the men of faith. Great spiritual giants like Moses, Isaiah, Jesus and Paul. But here we're introduced to Herman, a man, a craftsman, a man filled with wisdom, understanding, and skill, not knowing. He never knew that all that study, all that work that he did, he never knew that God was preparing him to build the temple of God. You know, some of you right now, you're probably in a dead-end job that you're thinking, what could good could ever come out of this? Not knowing that God could be preparing you right now for a great work. You need to be encouraged. You need to stay focused. Give everything you can. See, it wasn't enough to him. You know, a lot of you would have said, you know what? I think I'm only going to learn to work with um, wood. I'm just going to work with wood. That wasn't enough for him. He had to learn how to work with gold. He wanted to learn how to work with silver. It wasn't enough that he learned how to work with those materials. He also wanted to learn how to engrave on them. His passion for learning made him into someone who was sought after. And I'm telling you that those type of people are needed in ministry too. You know, we're always thinking, you know, I'll never get in ministry because I'm not a pastor. Let me tell you what, ministry needs more than just pastors. They need skilled people. Skilled people will learn how to put all this stuff up, you know, how to work on it. it uh, instrument uh, um, musicians, people that can help in leading worship, lighting technicians and things like that. Skilled people who can help bring forth the word of God. Amen? You know, you're thinking maybe, you know, I'm just in a, a job that just isn't, doesn't seem where it's going anywhere. Let me tell you what, God can use anything. God can use anything. So one, your skills are being polished. Number two is you're learning to play well with others. You know, that's a big thing. A lot of you, you don't do well with others. I know when I was, you know, when I came out of the Marine Corps, I had a very short fuse, didn't like working with others. As a matter of fact, I tell when I'd get on the job, I felt like I knew everything, so I should be able to call my own shots. Hey, look, I don't want to work with anybody. Put me alone. I'll go work in a unit by myself because I don't want to be around anybody. You know what? I don't learn anything in that. God's not able, you know, I'm not able to minister to people, you know, when your answers only beat them up. Yeah, you know, you, hey, man, I'm really, uh, I feel like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm having a hard time. I'm grow up. Uh, you know, that's not what you tell them. You tell, you know, well, let me, let's talk about it. You know, you don't tell them, uh, I mean, get a life. You know, it's a, you know, once you grow up, no, what you do is, is you got to talk to them. Well, you only learn that if you're spending time with people and learning how people react. God builds, and you may want to write this down, God builds our character through relationships. 
You become the person you are is when you are able to learn how to deal with others. You know, it's this uh, this real shame that I own my own business, and you know, I told the the group before I said. You know, people come to me and say, well, hey, man, I'm a Christian. I'd really like to come work for you. I hate to tell you this, but a lot of times that I've not had a lot of good luck with Christians. A lot of them have taken advantage of me. They don't show up to work on time. Uh, they leave early uh, and thinking, oh, he'll understand. He's, he's a Christian brother. You know, he, he'll let me go. You know, don't show up for work. Hey, man, where are you? Oh, I, th I thought I'd take a vacation. Well, you've only been here for a month. <laughs> oh, I, I thought you didn't understand. Yeah, I understand. You need to find another job. <laughs> That's what I understand. But, uh, you know, it, it's, it's funny. I told the group before, I said, you know, I, one of the worst people that ever worked for me who was a Christian was my daughter. Uh, she... <laughs> Oh my God, she was 18, she was about to go to college, she just wanted to work with me for the summer, which is bad, is when they're when they only going to work with you for a little while, because then they feel like, <laughs> the old man will understand, he'll get over it. Well, she, would, she had to open up the school, and she had to open up at 5, 7.30 in the morning. And I'm down, and she's living with me at the time, I'm down there doing my studies and everything, and I'm looking at my watch, it's 7.25, and she's not left yet. And all of a sudden I hear her waking up, and stumbling out of bed, and getting dressed and everything and she comes running down the stairs shoes in her hand hair's not even made up I'm Jessica you're going to be late she said no I'm not the time clock doesn't mark me late until 736 oh my god you know that you know the time clock is yeah yeah it's not gonna I, yeah, I'm not, only my daughter but she takes after her mother so that's I, she doesn't then she really takes after me but uh <laughs> But, I'm, you know, I'm trying to tell, to tell her, baby, you can't do that. You get away with it with me because I'm your dad. But I'm telling you, your next employer is not going to let you get away with that. We are to take pride in our work. We represent the Lord Jesus Christ at work. Some of the people at your job will never meet a Christian except maybe you. They don't have it in their, at their home or anything. So when they look at you, they see Christ. What type of Christ are they seeing? Good. For many of your co-workers, uh, you may be the only Christian influence in their life. Do you take that opportunity to show them godly work ethics, or do you work haphazardly, talk about your boss, and waste resources sometimes stealing them? I've seen that happen. I've seen guys, you know, you, you, they talk about the boss, laugh about him. Well, he don't know what he's doing. Laughing and everything, cutting up with everybody else. It's supposed to be a Christian. Hey, man, we shouldn't do that. No, just goes along with it. And then they become the boss and cannot even understand why everybody's making fun of him or her. Why are they doing that? I said, because you taught them that. You taught them it was okay. So they're talking bad about you now. They think it's funny that you're the boss. They're thinking you only got the job because you knew somebody. You know, and I'm, I'm so surprised. Sometimes people think God could never use me where I am. Let me tell you, when I graduated from seminary, I'm running ITI, Technical College. I'm the president, and I did not want to be there. I thought when I graduated from seminary that God was going to let me have my own church. So when I graduated, I'll never forget, I was all excited. I'm like, where, who, what church? What church am I going to be pastor of? And God didn't say anything. And then one night I was teaching a class, and... Uh, I go outside and there's this guy and he is in tears. And I'm saying, man, what's wrong? Are you okay? He goes, man, my wife just left me. I said, are you serious? He said, man, I don't know what I'm going to do. I said, well, let's pray, you know. So I prayed over him and everything and, and uh, said, look, I want to get involved. Let me know how things are going. So I left him and I go get in my truck. And I'm telling you, as I'm standing here right now, in the seat next to me was like it was God Almighty and he tells me, he says, you got all the ministry you can handle right here at 13944 Airline Highway, ITI Technical College. This is your calling right here. And I said, yes, sir. And it's been the greatest that happened in uh, 2007 and it has been the greatest seven years of my life. Once I realized that that's where God wanted me and that's where I was going to do ministry, it changed my life. And for a lot of you that hate your job, that's what's got to change. You've got to get focused in, this may be where God wants me to be. 
and I need to make the most of it and be the best I can be right here, not knowing what he may do in the future, but right here I'm going to be the best I can be. Amen? Because he may be teaching you that. He may be teaching you that. In 2 Thessalonians 3, 7 through 13, it says this, For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example, because we did not act in an undisciplined manner among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with labor and hardship we kept working night and day, so that we would not be a burden to any of you. See, Paul was always concerned about his, his representing Christ. He never wanted anybody to say anything. He just didn't live off of the, the... He could have lived off the tithe, but he didn't do that. He worked himself. He was a tent maker. And he worked day and night to take care of himself to be an example to all those others. Not because we have the right to do this, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you so that you would follow our example. For even when, you were with, when we were with you, we used to give you this order. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. For we hear that there are some of you that are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like busybodies. Now such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to work in quiet fashion and to eat their own bread. But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary of doing good. Paul gives us a great example of what a Christian should behave like on the job. To be a good example, to be disciplined, hardworking, not a busybody that is spreading gossip, but staying diligent. If that's not you, you need to start today. You need to be that person at work that Christ would be proud of to see there. You know, some of you, you do just enough to get by. I'm just going to, you know, I'm just doing just because I'm looking for the next best thing. Let me tell you what, that's not a good example because you know what it does? You don't give your whole heart to something that you're always looking over the fence at something else. It's just like a marriage. You can't give everything to your spouse if you're looking over the fence. Amen? If you're thinking how things could be. I'll never forget, I was, I was doing a men's group one time and, and all these guys are coming to me and I'm having to do all this counseling to men and I'm like, oh my God. So I finally had enough of it and I got up and I said, guys, I can't handle this anymore of you telling me how you wish your wife was this and she she looked like this and she cooked like that. If she was all of that, she would not have married you. She would have married up. You need to be happy she's with you. They were like, I never thought of it that way. Yeah. We don't, do we? Number three is the third thing that God's doing for you on the job is, is your character is being shaped. David learned all the skills he needed to be king while being a shepherd. Do you know a shepherd's probably the worst job? I know when we were in Africa, you know, the herdsmen, owning cattle is like the biggest thing. If you had 18 cattle, it was like having $500,000 in the bank. Your, your net worth or your, who you are in that community is by how many cows you have. And the herdsman is like the worst job you can possibly have. I'm, those guys work seven days a week, 24 hours a day, because they have to make sure that they're watching those cows and they don't miss one. And I think they're paid like, like $10 a week or something like that. David took that job and said, I don't care that I'm just a shepherd. I'm going to be the best shepherd. He honed his skills. He learned, he learned to fight a Goliath by killing the bear and the lion, correct? I mean, that's just like I was thinking how cool it is that you get to go on a camping trip and you may be eaten by a bear. That is like so cool. The re reason I say that is because I'm going on a bear hunt this September. And the guy who is going to be guiding me said, look, you know, there's some things that you need to know. This is very dangerous. Uh, we're going to put some bells on you so you don't startle a bear. We don't walk up on some cubs or something. And we're going to give you a big can of pepper spray. So you're going to have bells on, you're going to have pepper spray. And it's very important also, you know, we know what type of territory we're in. And um, I hope I can say this, but 
Black bear manure, is manure okay? Can I say? <laughs> black bear manure is, is, he said, you need to know the difference between the two. Black bear manure is very small. It's got some berries in it. It has maybe a little hair from some small animals. Grizzly bear manure has little bells in it and it smells like pepper spray. <laughs> So I said, that's very encouraging. So I kind of feel like I need to come and camp out with y'all, get close to the bear so I'm ready for that hunt. But uh, that's so cool. I got to sleep in my car because I could be eaten by a bear. We don't have that problem in Louisiana. Maybe an alligator. You can get eaten by an alligator, but that's about it. Um, your character is being shaped. Philippians 4, 11 through 13. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I'm in. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both in having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things. Listen to this. The reason I'm able to do that is because I can do all things through him who strengthens me. You know, a lot of people, they look at my life now, and I have to admit, I could have never, I, I forgot who I was telling that to. Uh, it was when someone in the first service, he was saying, man, I really need to hear your, your sermon this morning because things have been tough here in West Virginia. And it, because of what I told him was, I said, you know, people look at me now and they just think I'm blessed beyond. And I, I told him, I said, I have to admit that if, if seven, no, let's say 25 years ago, if God would have said, Joe, I'll give you anything you want, I could not have come up with what he's come up with me in my life right now. With Africa, with preaching here today, uh, for all the things that he's given me, all the material things and, and good health. And I could not have thought about all that stuff to ask for. But it wasn't always like that. I, what I thank God that he did was he let me see the bad times before I saw the good times. And I told the first group, I said, I can remember Christmas Eve night. I'm putting together a bicycle for one of my girls. And uh, I'm watching It's a Wonderful Life with Jimmy Stewart. Y'all know the movie, right? And it's the time when he's lost everything. The depression's come. His bank, he's lost everything. And he goes to this mean banker. And he says, look, I need cash to save my bank. And the banker says, well, what do you have as collateral? He says, well, I have a life, uh, a life insurance policy. And he goes, man, you're worth more dead than you are alive. And you know I heard that, and do you know that I was in such a bad way? And this was when I was, I was about 27 years old, and I'm 56 now. I have to admit, I thought, I said, you know what? Your family, your kids would be so much better if you just died right now. You're in such bad shape. Things are not going well. They'd be better off if you died and they, they lived off your life insurance. And now I think back and I go, how the devil wanted to steal a life. You know, some of you young people, you may think, God, man, I'm, I have such a loser life. Let me tell you what. I had one too, and today I feel like I'm the most blessed man on the planet. I actually believe that. And I, tell the, I tell the Lord every morning, I don't want to be nobody else but Joe Martin. As far as I'm concerned, he's got it going on. He's got it made. You know, so <laughs> praise God. I thank him. And that's somebody. I lost a child. I lost my daughter, 15 years old, in my arms. And I still look back and I say, God has given me, it's been almost like a Job experience. He's given me double, triple fold back to whatever I could have ever imagined. Five grandsons. This is from someone who had four daughters. Four daughters, one wife, a female dog, and a female cat. <laughs> Given me five grandsons, amen, and three son-in-laws that I actually like. So I'm, man, I feel like I'm, I'm a hit. It's so fun now to, when we, when we bet, not bet, but when we raise our hands, and say, okay, where are we going? If we get the whole family, where are we going for summer vacation? And the girls may say, we want to go do this or something. I used to go, oh God, <laughs> shopping three days because I'd get outnumbered. You know, I, I, I should have ran some type of dictatorship, but I'd go along, all right, we're going shopping for three days. Well, now that I have grandsons and son-in-laws, the girls will say, we want to go to, no, 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 no. We're going camping where there's bears, <laughs> you, know, so, you know, so the men rule now. It wasn't always like that, but we rule now. 
The fourth thing is, is you're being molded into a representative of Jesus Christ. Paul strived to represent Christ in all of his dealings. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 through 12, he says this. Now, as to the love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write you. So what he was saying, guys, you got it going on as far as the love thing. For you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. For indeed, you do practice it towards all brethren who are in, in, uh, who are in all Macedonia. But I urge you, brethren, to excel, excel still more. And these were the things he wanted them to excel at. Number one, to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. Now, I know for some of you, that is very foreign to you because your life is nothing but drama. But let me tell you what, God wants you to have a quiet life. He wants you to have a quiet life. That there is a world without drama, I promise you. Now, some of you may have to get rid of some friends who bring drama. Or like me, I have a sister who lives about 120 miles away, and I tell people all the time, as I love Agel in Lake Charles. She's 120 miles away. She, her life is drama. Well, not anymore. I think she's just gotten saved. She called me the other day and told me, Brother, I'm on fire for Christ. And, and this is a girl who has been through it all. I say that because what she would do is she'd call me and she'd say, My glass is half empty. Oh, gosh, I've just dropped the glass. Oh, no, I've just cut my foot open. Oh, I've got to go to the hospital. Oh, i just got in a wreck. Oh, no, I have no insurance. Oh, my God, I can't take listening to this conversation anymore. It's just drama upon drama. God wants us to lead a quiet life. So start working on that today. Start removing the drama that you may have in your life. Number two is, is make it... To attend to your own business is you need to mind your own business and work with your hands. Work with your hands, your own hands, just as we commanded you, so that you will have behave properly towards outsiders and not be in any need. So work to Paul was very, very important. In Colossians, he says this, Colossians 3, 22 through 24. He says this, slaves, and some of you may feel like that at your job, Slaves, in all things, obey those who are your masters on earth, not with external service as those who merely please men, now listen to this, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do your work heartily. I want you to underline heartily because that means your whole life, mind, and soul, everything. Do your work with everything in your being as for the Lord rather than men. See, a lot of you, you're thinking, I'm not going to do that for him. I don't like him. Or she, she's not worth it. She's, not, she's no good. She's, I don't like the company. She's horrible and everything. Guess what? You, you're saying you're working for someone. You're working for the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to forget that, that person. Just work for Jesus Christ. Just say, I'm going to be the best I can be. I'm going to be a representative for Jesus Christ because I'm working for him. I'm not working for them. You know, you may not like the company. It doesn't matter. You need to think that, of it this way. God's placed me here. This is my calling right now. And I'm going to do the best I can. Amen? Because he says, as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of your inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve, not man. And my favorite one is, is number five. Number five is you could be learning to lead a nation or a ministry. Don't despise the little things. You know, sometimes you get so caught up in where you are, you forget about where God could be bringing you. And you could ruin it all. You could ruin it all by saying, you know what, forget it. I'm stuck in this dead-end job. I'm going to do just enough to get by. I don't believe that you'll see the blessings that God may have for you if you do that. You know, how could God move you somewhere with that type of attitude? You know, he may be saying, I'm going to keep him right there and let him ruin those people. I'm not going to bring him somewhere else and let him ruin everybody else at that next job. I'm going to keep him right there. So you may end up staying right there. You know, a lot of people think that 
God, I wish I could do this or I could do that. Almost everyone in the Bible had their bad experience before they had their great experience. And what I want to read to you is Joseph. If you'll remember Joseph, Joseph was given a dream that he would be of royalty that he would be someone very important to the point that his brothers and his father would actually bow down to him. And they weren't too happy about hearing that. If you remember the story, they got so upset about it, his dad kind of confronted him. He says, you, you think I'm going to bow down to you? And his brother said, no, ain't nobody bowing down to you because we're about to throw you in a pit and sell you into slavery, which they did. So at that time, do you think... Do you think Joseph's thinking, wow, what's going on? I have a dream that tells me I'm going to be great, and here I am, just got sold into slavery. Let's look, look at what happens to his life. In Genesis 39, in Genesis 39, he's sent to Potiphar's house. Now, Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an Egyptian officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the bodyguard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph. So that's the first thing you have to ask yourself. Is the Lord with you at work? So he became a very successful man. Remember, he's a slave. And he was in his house of his master, the Egyptian. Now his master saw that the Lord was with him. Does your boss see that with you? Now his master saw that the Lord was with him and how the Lord had caused all that he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and became his personal servant. And he made him an overseer over his house. And all that he owned he put into his charge. It came about that at the time that he made him overseer of his house and over all that he owned that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house on account of Joseph. Thus the Lord's blessing was upon all he owned in his house and in the field. Listen to this. So he left everything he owned in Joseph's charge. And with him there was, he did not concern himself about anything except the food which he ate. So now you're thinking, what good in the world could come out of Joseph being sold into slavery? Guess what? He learns how to manage people. God's preparing him for something that he doesn't see. And it may be the same thing for you. You're in a dead-end job somewhere feeling like a slave, not knowing that God is taking that situation and trying to build character in you or trying to help you deal with people that you don't like or trying to get you to understand some principles of his word. And instead of accepting that, no, you want to fight it. You want to get out of there. You don't want to take that time to learn what God has for you. In prison, you're thinking, what could be worse than being a slave? How about getting thrown in prison after being falsely, uh, falsely accused of something? Well, the way I look at it is, is if you'll remember back, Joseph had a real problem with arrogance. What's the best way to get rid of arrogance? Let's throw him in prison. That'll do it. How can you be someone of high esteem and everything if, if they're closing bars behind you? You know, so now we're going to teach Joseph a little bit about being humble. In prison, he learned to be humble. He learned Egyptian justice and injustice. He also learned how Egypt works politically. Because you'll read here, listen to this. It says, now his master heard the words of his wife. If you can remember, she falsely accused him. Which she spoke to him saying, this is what your slave did to me. And his anger burned. So Joseph's masters took him and put him in jail. The place, listen to this, where the king's prisoners were confined. And he was there in the jail. But the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him and gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. When you're in God's will, I promise people will see his favor upon your life and it will not go unnoticed. You can always tell that person, and you want them in your life. You want to be around them. You want to give them. I have a man that works for me now. And, you know, it was, it was kind of funny. We wanted to hire him, and he graduated from a Christian college which, with a master's degree. The only problem was is the Christian college he graduated from wasn't 
recognized by the Department of Education, the U.S. Department of Education. So all that training he did, I wasn't able to use it because I have to have instructors whose education comes from a U.S. Department of Education recognized college. But he struck me so much in the, in the uh, when we interviewed him, I said, I have to have him in my company. And sure enough, we got him involved. We put him in student services. He doesn't teach, but he's in student services, and he's making such an impact on those kids. And I'm thinking to myself, man, I'm so thankful I just didn't write him off because the U.S. Department of Education didn't see him for who he was, that I saw the favor of God on his life and now and, and hired him. So uh, the chief jailer sees the favor of God on his life. The chief jailer committed to Joseph's charge all of the prisoners who were in the jail. Who does that? The kid, he's still a kid. He's, a, he's not even Egyptian, and he goes and gives him the keys to the jail. It says, here, you run it. So he commits all the charge of the prisoners who are in jail so that whatever was done there, Joseph was responsible for. The chief jailer did not supervise anything he did because the Lord was with him and whatever he did, the Lord made it to prosper. So here you're thinking, and I'm sure Joseph was thinking the same thing, man, I'm in jail. I'm just going to sit in this cell and rot. Nope. I'm going to take over. I'm taking over this jail, and I'm going to supervise everything. How many of you have thought about that on your job, where you're like, well, I'm just a secretary. I'm, I'm just a janitor. I can't make an impact. I promise you, you can make an impact at any job you have. I have a janitor who works for me, is loved dearly. Especially by the ladies, because he keeps, it keeps everything clean, and they love him. You know, the restrooms are clean, the, the uh, kitchen is clean and everything, and they just think he's the best. Has a great opportunity, great, great um, attitude. Doesn't walk around and go, I'm just the janitor. No, what he decided is, is that I'm going to be the best janitor that there is. You know, it's just like some, uh, we were talking the other day at, at, the, at, at church, and someone said, you know, I just dig ditches. We'll be the best ditch digger there is. I mean, take, make sure your shovel's sharpened. Cut so much ditch, the guy comes back and says, mean you cut all this ditch? Not only that, sir, but I know the exact angle that that ditch has to be to make sure that it doesn't uh, break down, that the sides don't crumble down. I also know exactly what level that ditch has to be to make sure the water flows all the way down to the, to the pipe. But no, some guys get out there, I'm digging a ditch. What a life. I can't wait till this is over. No, that's not what God's looking for. He's looking for those of us who have a great attitude no matter what he puts us in, not knowing that your character could be bu being built on that job right there at that time. So many of you think that you're just wasting your time not knowing that God could be teaching you something right now. Amen? Do you ever think, could God ever use you for a great cause? When God called David, he had to be summoned from his job as a shepherd. I want to read that to you again. Listen to this. Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is a skillful musician, a mighty man of valor, a warrior, one prudent in speech, a handsome man, and the Lord is with him. When did that happen? He's a teenager. He's a shepherd. And they know about him in the king's chamber. Isn't that amazing? Have you ever thought about that? That how could someone of so insignificance be brought to a place of such, to the being king of Israel? You know what's so funny is, is a lot of people gloss over the fact that his daddy didn't even think he was king material. Because what happens when Samuel shows up? Samuel shows up and says, um, one of your sons is um, about to be anointed king. He says, okay. Brings his first son, 
surely this is him, firstborn. Nope, that's not him. Next one, nope, next one, nope, next, nope. Is that it? Is that all of them? Did I miss God? No, I got a kid out watching the sheep right now. Go get him. Bring him up. Let's see who he is. God, that's him right there. Had to be called from the fields as a shepherd to be anointed king of Israel. How many of you, God has this great plan for you in your life, and you may have been, they go out to the field, David, I see all the sheep, where's David? Oh, he left. He didn't want to be a shepherd anymore. He said it was a waste of time. He left. Okay, well, Samuel was here, was going to anoint him king of Israel. I guess we'll just find somebody else. David said that though I'm a shepherd, I will be the best shepherd ever. People will hear from me from everywhere. Where would God find you today? Where would he find you today? Are you competent in the job that he's given to you? What do people say about you? Are you being the very best that you can be without complaining? Are you serving him when no one else sees what's going on? Because you know what? He sees you. He sees what you're going through. Would people say of you, the Lord is with that person? When you think no one's watching, no one cares what you're doing, God is watching you and he sees it all. You may never know what great purpose you're being prepared for right now. Right now. So don't give up. Don't compromise. Stay alert because your selection could be tomorrow. Amen? Won't you stand with me? Father, right now I know that there are people here who feel like they're in a dead-end job, that they're discouraged, Lord. And I just ask right now, Father, that you would touch them and let them know that even though they believe that, that that's not reality, that you see them, you know where they are, and you are preparing them for a mighty work, oh God. I thank you for each person here. It, it says a lot, Lord, that they're here right now to hear your word. And I'd ask that you bless them for that. Encourage them, oh God. I just speak encouragement right now to you all. In Jesus' name, amen.